Uh, the next uh, paper that will be presented will be presented by uh, Dr. Clements out of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And the title of the paper is Nutritional Effect of Oral Supplement Enriched Beta Hydroxy Beta Methyl Butrate Glumine and Arginine on Resting Metabolic Rate After Laparoscopic Gastric Bypass. Say that quickly five times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to present this data. Um, since the time we submitted this, I've actually moved to Vanderbilt now, so I must add that in there. But this data was largely done uh, while I was in Birmingham. Uh, I would like to disclose that this was sponsored by Abbott Labs, but we have no uh, financial interest in Abbott Labs to declare. This product is a mixture of two amino acids and one uh, leucine metabolite. The beta hydroxymethyl butyrate is a metabolite of leucine, and it's been showed has been shown in other studies to. Uh, preserve or to restore lean body mass in certain trauma patients. It's primarily been studied in cancer, trauma, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, some age patients, and in those groups it has been shown to preserve or restore lean body mass. However, it has not been studied in gastric bypass patients, and that was the population that we wanted to look at, obviously. Uh, just as a little bit of introduction, this metabolite of leucine has been shown to improve nitrogen balance, uh, arginine promotes wound healing and glutamine does is a well-known regulator of muscle turnover. Um, our hypothesis was that if we gave this uh, mixture of amino acids to patients, uh, they would, in the early post-operative period after a gastric bypass, we could inhibit their lean body mass loss, hopefully uh, be able to maintain their resting metabolic rate and modulate the uh, amount of total weight loss while not in, um, causing the in inhibition of their weight loss by the extra calories. Now, to, just to give you an idea of how we conducted this, we had 30 patients. This was a pilot study, randomized and unblinded. Uh, the patients knew what they were taking, so did the physicians, but they were randomized to either receive the supplement or not. Of course, it, this was under IRB approval. If they, you see our exclusion criteria here. I want to point out the weight limit being less than 300 pounds. Uh, this is a selected group of patients, uh, although they're morbidly obese, our DEXA table at that time would not go up to any higher weight, so we had to limit that. So this is a select group and not all comers for bariatric surgery. And in the experimental arm, these patients were asked to take two packets of this, which is 24 grams, mix it in eight ounces of water and drink this twice a day. Uh, you see the mixture of amino acids here a little bit of sugar, and get 78 calories per serving. So we're giving them almost an extra 160 liquid calories, which obviously is not going to contribute any to their satiety, and we were minimally but somewhat concerned about the calorie intake. Uh, they were asked to maintain a consumption log. How many times did they actually drink it to get an effort to have some assessment of compliance? The control arm did neither of those um, and were just followed as a routine. Each of these groups of patients were maintaining our usual bariatric follow-up program where they uh, were asked to take vitamins and calcium supplements as well. Uh, Preoperatively, each patient underwent a DEXA scan and indirect calorimetry uh, in the standard methods. I'm not going to go into that. You all are probably very familiar with that. We repeated the study two weeks after the operation and eight weeks later. I will point out to you that the indirect calorimetry was done after an overnight stay in our GCRC the patients did not get out of bed. The room was thermal neutral, so they were awakened and maintained in the awakened state while the indirect calorimetry was undergoing, but before they actually got out of the bed the first thing in the morning. So tried to get in a true resting metabolic rate. Now, this gets kind of busy, and I really don't want to go through this entire slide with you other than to point out uh, this is a little bit smaller population, again, the BMI is only 43 here for the reason that I told you about our DEXA table. So this cannot necessarily be generalized to any bariatric patient, again, pointing out the small group. But the column I want to emphasize is just in the total population and in the experimental versus control, there was no differences in any of these groups. And again, pardon the busyness of this slide. If you look at the entire population, all 30 patients, irregardless of being in the control or in the experimental arm, 
everything changed as you might expect in the post-op period. At two weeks, they had lost 6.8 kilograms. Their BMI had changed by two and a half. The fat mass decreased, but also lean body mass is already decreasing at two weeks. Calorie consumption is also uh, gone down by 226 calories per day. If you follow it on out to eight weeks, you see a continuation of this trend, although at eight weeks you start to see the fat mass outpacing the lean body mass weight loss. Uh, calorimetry still shows a little bit of decrease in calorie consumption. This is 291 calories less than the pre-op. Uh, sorry, I didn't have the negative number, uh, negative sign in front of that, but all of those values are highly significant as you might expect, even in this small group of patients. Now, this is the value of each of the data points at two weeks. I want to point out again, a very busy slide, but the only thing I want you to really pay attention to is the fat mass loss. This was not statistically significant. Everything else on this slide, when change, the change in comparison from total population to, to two weeks in the experimental arm, in the control arm, everything was significantly different at two weeks except the fat mass. The fat mass did not change significantly in the control group. It did change significantly in the experimental group. Again, this is very small and subtle changes. I'm not sure if that's a function of the um, number of patients and, again, a pilot study, but that was the only difference that we observed at two weeks. This is probably more revealing that the, the mean of the changes in the experimental versus the control group were not significant. The difference that I showed you in fat mass, that change being non-significant was from pre-op to uh, the two-week post-op within the control group. This is comparing the changes between the two groups. I hope that's not too confusing, but there's no difference in this number compared to this number in any of the observed parameters. Now, we follow this same pattern now out to eight weeks. We've repeated all the same studies. You see the total population here. All of the changes between baseline and eight weeks in each of these are significantly different. And the, the changes, however, uh, excuse me, you, you notice that the, the fat mass is down now pretty comparably in all three groups. The BMI changes are the same. The lean body mass change is the same. And the decrease in the resting metabolic rate are the same. So we saw no difference between the two groups nor in the total population when comparing the three groups to each other. This is the same way of comparing the change, the mean change between the experimental group and the control group. Our intervention had no effect is what this shows. So to summarize this, at two weeks, all the variables that we measured decreased significantly with the exception of the fat mass in the control group. Uh, at eight weeks, we saw a very similar thing. We saw all the variables decrease significantly at eight weeks. The difference between the change in the experimental group and the control group was not different. Weight loss was not adversely affected by the addition of 160 liquid calories. Now, let me just point out several limitations about our study. It, it's obviously very small numbers with a pilot study. We recognize that. Would these numbers have panned out to be different with larger numbers? We don't know, uh, but this was pilot data at best. We had a short duration of the intervention. We only followed this out for eight weeks. The idea is not necessarily to continue this out and find out if this makes a difference 12 to 18 months later. Uh, the rapid weight loss, as you all are very well aware, occurs in the relatively early post-op. It would have been nice to follow this out perhaps to six months to see what the difference was at that point. But again, limitation of the funding uh, limited us to the number of patients as well as the number of times we could uh, redo the uh, DEXA scan and the uh, resting metabolic rate. We, I didn't mention any of this because compliance issues, as you are all well aware, are difficult in this group for follow-up. They're difficult to ask them to write down a dietary log, much less how many times they consume this. And if they write it down, can you even trust what they write down in a compliance log? So we really have no good assessment of how well they complied with the protocol. The other thing that I want to point out is our metabolic, you know, I mean our um, 
nutritional supplement intervention may, be very, may have a very different effect in this group of patients compared to the trauma patient, the critically ill, the AIDS patient, because of the alterations in the GI anatomy. And as you've heard discussed in multiple talks this week, uh, the alteration in the gastrointestinal hormonal milieu, could that have had some implications in that? Had they had normal GI tracts, would this have had effect? Obviously, we don't know. We did not have a, um, a group of patients not undergoing gastric bypass and uh, as serving as another control, so I don't have any way of answering that. The other thing that's different about this patient population compared to the other population in which this product has been studied is that these patients may have had much more limited substrate availability. In the critically ill patient, the trauma patients, many of those had gastrostomy or feeding tubes and the amount of protein, fat, and carbohydrate was much easier to control in that population and therefore was able to uh, maybe have some effect. We can't really compare morbid obesity and gastric bypass patients to that population uh, because the disease states are not the same. Morbid obesity is a lifelong condition. Generally, if you have cancer or a major event, you either die from it or you recover from it fairly quickly. These patients are going to be at this state for the rest of their lives. So finally, to wrap this up, this did not alter the lean body mass or the resting metabolic rate, but it didn't have any adverse effect on the weight loss. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.